So today, I'd like to talk to you about dogs. Dogs and wise men and you. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 that we just read together gives the biblical account of the wise men who in about 1 BC went on a mission that seemed anything but wise. But wise men want to worship him. Wise men want to worship him. These wise men who seemed anything but wise in their journey, they said this. They said, we saw the star of the Son of God in the east, and we have come to worship him. They did not say, we're skeptics who have come to investigate. Did you notice that? Nor did they say, we're scientists who come to experiment. Nor did they say, we're philosophers who come to debate over what's happening here. No, they said, we have come to worship him. Now, like I was saying, most people wouldn't consider that wise at all. I mean, there's no record of what their wives thought about the whole idea. What did they do? They traveled on foot and by camel for hundreds of miles, these wise men. Night after night, week after week, month after month, sleeping under the stars or huddled against the night's chill around the campfire in the middle of nowhere to get to worship. To finally get to see a newborn baby. And if he's not taking a nap or getting his diaper changed or being burped or spitting up, to get an opportunity to worship him. To finally get to see the babe. And to worship him. You know, most folks wouldn't consider that wise. But, you know what? If there ever have been men in the world called wise, these guys are the ones. They are, that's their only identification. In fact, historically, there's no other men just called the wise men. And these, they are the wise men. Now, to decide if they were really wise, to decide if they were really wise and wise to worship Jesus, I need to do something very strange. I need to tell you about my dog. My dog's name is Jack, and he is, a, he is a purebred miniature schnauzer. Here's a picture of my dog yep. in his Christmas gear. To decide if the men were truly wise to worship, I want to tell you about my dog, Jack. See, when I get home from work, Jack hears the sound of my car in the driveway, and immediately his face appears in the front sliding glass window of the house. His ears are up, and his eyes are fixed on the car. We always say that as we pull in. We see his face. You have a dog, right? Face in the window. What he is saying by his behavior to me is, my master is worthy of my attention. The minute I open the car door, as soon as he sees me, he races around through the living room and down the stairs, the front door of the house, where he knows I'll be coming in. Saying by his behavior, my master is worth my effort. Before I get my key in the door, he's scratching with his claws or, on, on, the, or on, on, the, on the side panel of the door as if to make a way for me to come in. Maybe he thinks that when he hears my, my keys scratching the lock, maybe he's trying to think, maybe he's thinking, I'm trying to dig my way in. But he says to me by, by his behavior, he says, my master, my master is worth doing whatever it takes to get to him. As soon as I get into the house, Jack starts jumping and slapping the air with his paws and acting playful and happy. Then he races in and out of the door five or six times, right? Until I shut the door, which says to me, by his behavior, that Jack is saying, my master makes me happy. As I set my keys in the basket and hang up my coat, the whole time he'll be up on the landing, three steps up, huffing and puffing and flipping his bunny toy around, making it squeak and talking in this little kind of growly dog voice, right? As if to say, the party can start now. And look, I brought a gift. As if he's saying, my master wants me to celebrate. And as I get to the top of the stairs, he'll dance and prance a jig around me, bunny squeaking as he frolics, saying, my master gives me energy and excitement. And then he does this little thing. He does a little bow. It's like this little yoga stretch that he does, and he brings his little tail nub high in the air and his little furry beard low to the ground, like he's bowing before me. When Jack sees me, you see, everything about him says, you are worth my attention and my effort. Everything about him says, you are worth doing whatever it takes for me to get into your presence. You make me happy. You make me want to celebrate. You give me energy and you give me excitement. You have the adoration of my heart. Now, why in the world am I telling you all this about my dog? Because the word for worship in the New Testament, get this, the word for worship in the New Testament, the original Greek word, proskuneho, proskuneho, 
It means to worship. Pros, toward, ku, dog, neho, worship. Therefore, worship literally means to make oneself like a dog to someone in the original language this was written in. When the wise men announced they had come to worship Jesus, the word they used means to make yourself like a dog to someone. They were saying, when we noticed the star, God got our full attention. He was coming. We made every effort to get to him, not by scratching and scratching at the door, but by traveling hundreds of miles across the desert. And now we'll do whatever it takes to come into his presence. We are filled with joy. We bow at his feet. We want to celebrate. The party can start now. He's here, and look, we brought gifts. He has given us energy and motivation and excitement enough to make this long journey to adore to worship. Jesus, they're saying, is worth my attention and my effort, and I'll do whatever it takes to get to him. Jesus fills me with joy, makes me want to celebrate, and fills me with energy and excitement. Can you see this scene? On coming to the house, Matthew 2.10, they saw, they bowed down, they worshipped, and they gave him gifts. We get that backwards sometimes, I think. We give presents, we come to a worship service, but do we really bow down in our hearts to him? Do we take the time to see him as he really is? This Christmas, let's do it in the wise men's order. Let's seek and find our joy in Jesus. Then let's slow down and see him as he really is. Then let's bow before him altering our stature to fit our true relationship with him. And then let us worship him, becoming like my dog is toward our master. And finally, let us give him gifts. See, when it comes to Jesus, wise men want to worship him. But wait, wicked men want to get rid of him. Check out verses 13 through 18, right? Herod had smiled, directed the Magi in verse 8 and says, As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. But in truth, worship was the farthest thing from Herod's mind, wasn't it? He wanted nothing more than to murder this pretender to the throne, right? Send out a fleet of Roman swords and be done with him, which he did. I've known some Herods in my time. When their children come home from church excited and innocent in, the, innocent in their excitement to tell their daddy that they gave their hearts to Jesus, these Herods, they, they somehow find a way to murder their infant's faith and destroy their child's belief in God. Have you ever had anybody in your life say that? You're not going back to church, right? You don't need that kind of stuff. Have you ever had a Herod in your life? My Bible tells me that on Judgment Day, it'll be better for them to have never been born. The Herods. Speaking of these little mini Herods, Jesus growled. He said this. He said, but if anyone causes these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be thrown in the depths of the sea. Matthew 18. Fathers and mothers, grandparents, family, never squelch the faith of your children. Even if it's Africa, even if it's just way out of your concept of what faith should be. But I've seen another kind of Herod, the kind that is too busy with their own worldly affairs to go worship the Lord themselves. Go, they say, like Herod, even though Bethlehem was only an hour away, right? If Herod was so delighted to go worship Jesus, why did he not accompany them on their short journey? Because you know why? Because his secular, business-soaked heart had no real intention of worshiping. That was for weak-willed women and children and maybe these foreigners, but not Herod. He was too important. He was a man of the world. And I have known some Herods who have said, it is fine for my wife and kids to go to church, but my time is too valuable. History teaches us that Herods don't die very well. I have done Herod's funeral once or twice. And I can tell you it's a sad thing when a family gets along better after their passing than when he was still in the home. The hallmark of wicked men is they want to be rid of Jesus. 
Don't talk to me about him. Don't bother me with that talk. I don't need a savior. So when it comes to Jesus, wise men want to worship him, but wicked men want to be rid of him. How about you? We must each choose whether to worship in our own him in our own life or be rid of him. There is no middle ground. It was Christmas time, December 25th, 30 AD, and Jesus was walking in the winter time through the courtyard of the temple. This was when they celebrated Hanukkah, the rebuilding and the rededication of this very temple, and the celebration was huge, and they called this the Feast of Dedication in those days. Anyway, it was winter, and Jesus is making his way along the eastern side of the temple. And the weather is probably bad, and this might have been the reasons why Jesus was walking under the shelter of the porch, the canopied porch that was called Solomon's Colonnade. And since it was the only thing that we can say for sure happened to Jesus around Christmas time in his adult life, let's, I'm going to take a second to look at it. I'm going to read this to you, John chapter 10, if you want to follow along, verses 22 through 39. Right, so in John 10, 22, it says, It was now winter, and Jesus was in the Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. He was in the temple, walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. And the people surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you were the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is my work that I do in my Father's name, but you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them away from me. For as my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else, no one can take my sheep from my father's hand. And the father and I are one. Once against the people, once again, the people picked up stones to kill him and Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which of these are you going to stone me? And they replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. For you, a mere man, claim to be God. Verse 36 goes on. And Jesus says, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the son of God? After all, the father set me apart and sent me to the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done, even if you don't believe me, then you'll know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. And once again they tried to arrest him, but he walked right away and left them. Do you know what I notice in this interaction here? Is that Jesus was drawing a bright and unmistakable line between those wise enough to worship him and those who would like to be rid of him. He's saying, listen, you want to know if I'm actually God? I forgive sins. I give people eternal life. I do miracles. What more do you want? You just refuse to believe. And then what was their reaction? What was their reaction, the people's reaction? What category did they fall into then by trying to attack him? Wise men or Herod? Well, they tried to kill him, just like Herod, right? Verse 31. See, Jesus never left any middle ground. That's the thing about Jesus. He always insisted that he was God's son. Now, the Jews totally knew what he was saying. Like, they had this mysterious little chapter in the psalm, Psalm number 2. It was a prophecy about the Messiah. And the climax of it is this, Psalm 2. It says, The king proclaims the Lord decree. The Lord said to me, Jesus, you are my son. Today I become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession, and you will break them with an iron rod. You smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoicing and with trembling. Submit to God's royal son or he'll become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities, for his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all those who take refuge in him. See, for hundreds of years, the Jews tried to figure out, the Jews tried to figure out, what does this mean? What does this mean? And Jesus says, you know what it means? It means me. I am God's only son. Worship me. I'm your only hope. I don't think you like the other options. So how about you? How about you? Here we go. 
Tell you what, we're about to become wise men and wise women. All right? We're going to close in a word of prayer. And as we come to God in prayer, if you want, I'd like for you to close your eyes with me, if you'd like to. And with your eyes closed, let's look to Jesus right now in our heart. With your eyes closed, look to him in your heart. Look at him. Eyes closed. Look at Jesus. Think about him. Remind yourself of what the personality of Jesus is like. Based on what his personality is like, what would Jesus' face look like to you from what you know about him? What are the qualities that you would see there? See him as the wise men did. Truly see him. The healer. Redeemer. Lover caregiver. Now let's bow before him. You can bow your head or bow your heart. Let him know that he is higher and that you are lower. Now let's worship him. Pray silently on your own, telling him how much you love him. Tell him how glad you are to be sitting in his presence right now. How much he makes you happy. How you'll do whatever it takes to be closer to him. And how he makes you feel like celebrating. Worship him. And now let's give him gifts. Silently in your heart, tell him what you would like to give Jesus this year. Tell Jesus what you would like to give him this year. Maybe it's your temper. Maybe you're going to give your temper to him to take away in exchange for his patience. Maybe it's your purity you'd like to give to him. You're throwing away your lust this year. And you're guarding what your eyes see as a gift to him. Maybe it's forgiveness you'd like to give to Jesus. There's someone you've been holding a grudge against who's hurt you and you're going to forgive them as a present to him. Can you do that? Maybe your present to him is one of trust. You've been worrying about many things, but as a gift to him, you are going to trust him and stop worrying this year. Maybe for you, the gift that you'd like to give him is faith. You've been focusing on your doubts instead of your faith, and as a gift, you're going to believe what he says this year without questioning everything. Give to him. See him. Worship him. Give to him. Maybe all you have to offer is yourself. Romans 12 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Lord, this is what I have to offer you. Myself. The gift you ask for today is me and my heart, my adoration. I trust you. I lay my heart before you, not knowing the future, not knowing what will happen, even when I walk out the door today. Lord, I give you my heart. That is what I give to you this Christmas. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Don't you feel wiser already? Better? Closer to heaven and farther from the world? This is how we become wise men, wise women, wise people.